Welcome to WP Tonic, episode 203. Today we're talking our web design influences. Yes, we are, John, and uh, we've got a great panel here. I'd like to introduce our panel to you, and I'm going to start off with Jackie. You'd like to introduce yourself? All righty, I'm Jackie D'Elia with Jackie D'Elia Design, and I'm also the host of Rethink.fm, and I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's great. Let's go on to our next panelist, Sally. Hi, I'm Sally Getch. My business is WP Fangirl. I mostly do custom Genesis theme development. I'm also the organizer of the East Bay WordPress meetup in Oakland, California. And my co-host, my beloved co-host, John Locke. Yep, I'm John Locke. My business is Lockdown Design. I provide SEO and custom WordPress development for mid-sized businesses. And my co-host, Jonathan Denwood. Yes, folks, I'm the founder of WP Tonic, so you can blame me for all this madness. And this is our Friday roundtable show. We're missing some people, some deliverance, um, but the hardcore have shown up. So we're going to have a fantastic show. We're going to go into... Um, some news stories, but it's been a bit of a morning for me, folks. Um, my, my normal office, the internet went down for the whole building. Shock horror. But um, uh, the Reno University came and saved me, and I'm at their very nice entrepreneur center in the heart of Reno, Nevada. So I thought I'd give them a plug first, and they provided me with free coffee, folks. So it can't be too bad, can it? Um, so if I'm a little bit flustered, that's why. Uh, um, let's go into our first news story. Um, and is the WordPress economy shrinking? Shock horror from the great Chris Lemmer. Um, what did you think of this, Jackie? I think that some areas of the WordPress ecosystem are shrinking and some are expanding. And I think it just depends on what you're looking at. Um, you know, maybe the rate of growth has slowed a little bit, but I definitely would say that the theme market is saturated and there's a lot of themes available that are free and paid. And I think, you know, trying to break into that market and uh, get some growth out of that is going to be very challenging. I think more so the plug-in market is probably where a lot of the action is. Um, but I, I mean, based on the numbers of where WordPress is, I, you know, maybe the, the, the growth curve is slowing a little bit. I think a lot of times also people just need to really see value in something before they want to purchase it. Now, I think I've gotten a little more discriminating about what I want to add to my WordPress toolkit as well. Um, I've got some core things that I can't live without that I will pay for. And then I've got some others that I'll try. And uh, if it, if it isn't an exact fit for me, I'll, I may let it go. So I, I think uh, it depends on who you're look, what you're looking at. I think they're great points, Jackie. Um, I was actually listening to some other podcasts and um, more in the entrepreneur, <clears throat> entrepreneur freelance sector. And they were talking about um, also um, kind of resistance in the SaaS market about people saying that they can't buy another SaaS product that you know when they've worked it out about four hundred dollars is leaving their check account every month so I think I think other areas of the tech market are facing um, similar problems yeah and I also think from a client side perspective I think that the market is pushing us to integrate WordPress into lots of different things and to bring different things into WordPress that it's not that just WordPress website is going to thrive in a silo. So I think we all as developers uh, need to be thinking about how can you expand WordPress and pull things into WordPress and bring in additional content and functionality through APIs. And I think uh, that's where uh, ultimately it's going to serve clients best. That's great. What did you think of the um, article and video, Sally? Uh, I, I confess, I didn't watch the video. I only read the article. Oh, shock, uh, I will, shock, I will, shock I will, horror. I will pretty much run a mile before breakfast to avoid watching videos. 
uh, <coughs> and um, is, is this if this is this like phobia linked to mobile phones and other things that you refuse to use that, that i that i don't no i mean i don't have a smartphone mostly because i i i don't like the format that much and the the data plan is you know that is a chunk of money that i really don't need to spend uh and uh, but the video is i feel like i don't have time for video if, if i'm in front of my screen i i want to be working so i want you know podcasts in audio format so i can listen to them while i'm driving a car or cooking or something like that and uh, you know and and i want other content in text format because i can read faster than you can talk so unless you're demonstrating something that i need to see i don't want a video and, and i know i'm in a, a tiny minority uh, because of that. But anyway, I mean, you know, Chris Lama is a smart guy. I think he had a pretty good analysis of this. I think that further, if you haven't listened to Jackie's interview with Morton Rand Hendrickson, you should, because uh, they talk about this topic in terms of, you know, you need to be more than a WordPress shop. You need to, to think about the, the larger picture of, of what your clients need. And, uh, you know, what uh, I haven't gotten a, a particular sense that the WordPress economy is shrinking. I mean, we keep hearing new stories about people who've, you know, made lots of money with whatever their, uh, you know, their product or, or services and people who've been able to launch new uh, plugins in a market that you'd think might be saturated because there are six or 10 already. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that there may be, you know, less work on the Kind of the implementer end if more people are you know if it's easier for people to do it themselves like because some of these products like page builders are so successful there will be more people you know doing more things themselves and and not hiring people as much for it and i don't think it makes uh i don't think it makes that much difference for people who have you know a good range of skills and also a good uh a good sense of perspective you know if if you are the kind of programmer who has to be told exactly what to do and then you have you know the good javascript skills and php skills and whatever other skills you need to build it but you never think about what you're what you're building or why you're building it or whether this is the best thing to build you're going to remain in a, a you know in a, in a low paid market yeah if you if you understand more about what's important to your client and how to ask the right questions and that they may not be, they may not know what they really need. They may say, oh, well, I, you know, I saw this over here and it looked cool. Uh, and you can't ask those questions. And I know you guys have interviewed people who, you know, who part of their approach to clients is to keep asking questions. Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do it now? Why do you want to do it with us? And, and make people really, uh, really think. So, you know, I, I I don't feel worried about the WordPress economy. And, and I think, you know, if you do, it means maybe you need to up your game or, or change your focus a little. Yeah, I think, I think you're right there, but I think it's just a very fluid moving target, you know, obviously, um, obviously um, the page builders and their rapid explosion um, I've wrote a very extensive article that I'm going to be publishing hopefully this month about that particular subject. Um, you know, it has had an effect on the market, um, but that was necessary because otherwise I think WordPress was going to lose some traction and I actually in some ways think it's a beneficial thing. Um, and then we, um, me and John had the interview with Zach Rosen, the CEO of Pantheon, and you know, um, a bit like what um, Chris Lemmer was saying, um, I think um, there's big opportunities in the middle market that where WordPress has been slightly dismissed. What do you think about all this, John? Well, I got to tell you, um, there this is not just a WordPress thing. I, I'm with Jackie in, when you're talking about the WordPress economy, you're talking about products and you're talking about services. Uh, when Jackie said that the theme market is in a, a downturn, it's kind of saturated, that's true. Nine, eight, seven years ago, themes were still a big thing. Right now, plugins are, are a big opportunity if you're selling products. 
Now, me, myself, I just focus on services. Client services is, is where I do my thing. And I think on the lower end, um, a lot of people who would normally hire, uh, just say somebody out of college or something like that for a thousand dollars to set up a theme for us theme. I mean, yes, that end of the market is going to get constricted because it's undifferentiated. Uh, literally almost anyone can do that now. Uh, the, the one thing that I would say too is if, um, you have good support if you're a product company or if you have good service, customer service, if you're a services company and you have something that is differentiated from everybody else, the market is booming for you. It, um, we actually saw a couple of years ago, and Chris was talking about this as well, that the very top end of the market, like people are bringing designers in house. Uh, IBM has slowly uh, collected the greatest design team like ever assembled right now. They've, they brought all these people in house a couple of years ago, uh, a large agency adaptive path. They went to go work for capital one as their in-house team uh, here locally. Uh, I seen a, a local uh, company, Lofty Word, it was like a three person team. They went to go work for uh, a client of theirs that they had been doing work for, uh, TNN Lax, they went to go work for Facebook. So this is happening. But I think if you differentiate yourself, if you put a stake in the ground and say you serve like a certain type of customer, or you solve a specific type of problem, and you're addressing like problems that are, um, harder than just you need a website then you're still going to find work and that middle ground is very vast i would say that that you know for a lot of people the economy the wordpress economy is still very much booming i i think you have to have something that that's worth selling though and that means you know figuring out who it is you serve and what it is that you want to do and then you know getting that in front of people I, I would say that the WordPress economy is still going strong. Yeah, I see it very similar to the car industry. You know, you've got prestigious dealerships that, you know, they get most of their income from servicing, supposedly. Um, then you have second tier garages and then you have a very big DIY market of people that want to work on their car. I, 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 they like doing it or they haven't got the money to get somebody to do it for them. Um, personally, myself, the last thing I want to do is work on my car. Um, so, um, so it's a very diverse marketplace. Um, I see that um, comparison to some extent applying to websites. And I, I think it's linked if a company really sees absolutely no value in their website, um, but they feel that they've got to have one, and I think in 2017, I don't care what kind of company you are, you, you need a website. And those that advise you that you don't, I think you should run to the hills because they're giving you very bad advice. Um, but on the other hand, if you still, you feel that, You've got to have a website, but you just don't feel it has any value to the business. You, you are, you're not going to invest any real money in it. And before WordPress, before Joomla, before these hosted services, you still had to hire somebody because the, there was no practical way, easy way of building a website i think the landscape's really changed what what do you think about that sally do you think i'm just talking a load of tosh oh jonathan we always think you're talking a load of tosh, but... <laughs> that's what i thought i would ask you sally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh <clears throat> No, I think I. So, I shall we end the conversation? I, th I think uh, I, 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 I think I think you have a. Uh, I think you do have a uh, have a point there about that, and and you know I don't know if we've beaten the horse to death and and need to. Uh, uh, hey, you need to move on. Yeah, but I'd like to, to just say just one quick thing, just on that. Um, I've been working a little bit with Beaver Builder lately, and I have to say, on the plugin side. Some of the really nice things are the templates that you can bring in to your theme. So now it's just not 
your theme is driving everything that, um, and, and I wonder if that is going to, at some point, maybe the themes are not going to be as important for the styling and everything. And there might be lots of other options to bring styling elements in, in different ways. I just wonder if the division between themes and plugins are going to start to blur in some way. I'm just, well, anyway. uh, yeah, I, I don't know. In one way, I hope not because we've just struggled so hard to get all yes, the plugin exactly. functionality out of, exactly. out of themes. I suppose this is a little different. It's putting theme functionality into plugins. And in, in some ways that makes more sense because you might be doing that anyway if you're adding uh, post types or, or other functionality that you know in, includes some, uh, in, include some styling i think we probably will see more themes like you know it's I, adam was telling us about uh, last time where he's got uh, uh, you know they they're designing a sort of pretty much you know blank canvas to use with page builders uh we'll we'll probably see some more of that happening uh, for people who really want a bunch of different layouts but you know it does come back to the idea that having a tool like this doesn't make you a designer uh, so you know, we'll see kind of where the where the market goes in that. Because if you really think about, oh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna create a whole theme. I'm gonna think about every part of this and how it needs to look together, and how it needs to, you know, where I need to to create the, uh, you know, the the <clears throat> you know the 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 atoms of of this thing, so that oh, okay, you know, buttons are gonna look like this, and menus are gonna look like this, and you know. Uh, we're going to figure out the, uh, uh, you know, all the typography and, and what goes where and, and decide that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that very many people actually want to tackle that. I, I read an article a, a while back that where um, somebody was saying sort of like, you know, I was talking about like how to, I don't know if it was like how to pick a technology or how to pick a theme or maybe I may be confusing a couple of articles, but they, they were saying, oh, it, you know, like it shouldn't be built on a starter theme or a framework or whatever. And, and like, what? Now, you know, there's a difference between like loading in a whole CSS framework when, it, when you're going to use two things out of it because that's just inefficient and reinventing the wheel so that you spend a whole lot more time. On, on building something that you, you know, that the market says you can only like, you know, sell for 60 bucks a pop. Uh. Yeah, I, 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 we could continue this there, but I think um, we should go on to the other story about Matt, Matt Man and Weg on, um, on um, that's interesting as well. Um, but I think we could continue this discussion. What, one thing for sure is there's a lot more choice I think that's the key. There's a lot more choice choices in the marketplace that are coming up this year and next year. And it's going to be really interesting to see how all this works out. So I, I think we should go on to um, the interview that um, Matt Molinweg had on applied filters um, about his decision to get more involved in the actual to, to the, be the lead in the next cycle and the consequences of that. So um, let's start with John. Um, what did you think of the interview? And what did you think some of the key things you got out of it? Well, I'm a bad person to start with because I actually haven't even listened to it. So oh dear, well, there we I go. have no opinion. Got no opinion. Let's go to somebody else that's got opinion. But John's been, I like John's been really flat out with work, so I excuse him. Um, Jackie, have you been a good girl? Have you listened to this? I or you been, have you been naughty as well? Nope, I listened to the episode this morning. Um, and I, you know, well, first off, just listening to Matt Mullenweg talk is just very calming and it is, isn't soothing. it? Yes, I, I, I felt like, like I went I, to the every spa time I hear morning. him, I, I am overpowered by this feeling of oh, he's such a nice boy. He um, is, isn't he? Um, which he is. which is not entirely true, but that is no, he cannot. He, he definitely isn't, but he, uh, he's got a very soothing. Manager, it's very, it? it very calm and yes, meditative. Just, uh, from, from the first time I met Matt, it was like you have uh, it, mental visions of him helping old ladies across it, the street. The one word that I would link with Matt is smooth. That's the um, one word. That's one word you can't link to me, is it, Sally? You couldn't link smoothness with me, could you? 
I, 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 uh, I, I, I have to say, you're probably right there. <laughs> I, I think that one uh, point that, sure, that perhaps. he made in oh, here... Oh, no, I'm a teddy bear at heart, really. Go on, Jackie, I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, I think one point was is that trying to run, uh, you know, WordPress.org by consensus is difficult and that um, sometimes you need direction, you need somebody to push things. Think of like a Steve Jobs and what he was able to do with you know, can you imagine if they had tried to do everything consensus-based uh, and waited for people to, to weigh in on where they thought things should go? I, uh, I think Apple would be in a different place right now if they did. Uh, I think that his wanting to focus on things that haven't moved along as quickly as he'd like and uh, just the fact that he's concentrating on maybe focusing more on accomplishing some things that were important. And obviously the customizer and the editor these are the focus right now is on tools to make it easier for people to work in WordPress. And I think that's definitely, you know, with the end user in mind. And even though we don't have any telemetry to suggest what people are actually doing in WordPress, and I, and I honestly think those that would be very helpful for these decisions that are being made. But you could argue on the flip side of that, that there's not enough time to do all of that and you need direction and you need focus and you wanna move it forward. Uh, so I think that you know where they're going right now is the customizer and the editor and making things easier for, for people to use. I thought some other things in the conversation were very interesting about how Automatic got started and you know what it was like early on and uh, things that have happened. I, he mentioned he's got a thick skin now. And I think that, uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of things thrown back and forth all the time in that community and to, uh, it, it can't be easy, it can't be easy. So I left the interview feeling um, more positive, I guess, than I have been. What did you think of it, Sally? I only got through the first 20 minutes, but it was very uh, interesting. Well, did, you, did you fall asleep or something? Uh, no, I, 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 was, uh, I was working <laughs> flat out until about 10 o'clock last night. So I heard the first 10 minutes while making dinner and the, and the next 10 minutes while making breakfast. Um, but, uh, uh, and I definitely plan to, to listen to the rest of it. But a couple of things that struck me even in that fairly short span were, you know, one, the fact that, you know, like, you know, Yes, these, some of these problems, these are obvious to us. It's not like nobody ever noticed before that there was an issue with the editor or with, you know, that there, there are some things like, you know, code syntax highlighting that, that have been there for, uh, you know, seven years is on, on track. And that one of the things he, he wanted to do was investigate why is it that some of these things have taken so long to do and, and that part of it seemed to be the way the last few years had structured their release cycle so that they, you know, they, they were, you know, knocking off a lot of tickets in every release, but there was just sort of nothing to get excited about. And that, uh, uh, but also that Matt actually, you know, confessed to be willing to break backwards compatibility in a good cause, uh, which I think is fairly revolutionary, yeah. Uh, yeah. given the way, you know, WordPress has operated that, you know, that they know that when they put the Gutenberg editor in, this is going to break some stuff in the way thing, people have done some things and that they need to make it worth it that he felt that you know when they brought out WooCommerce 3.0 you know it broke things without there being enough to show for it and and you know he wants to give people an, an incentive to have to deal with uh, breaking things but I, I think that really makes a, a difference and that you know that sort of awareness that yeah you know WordPress has been sort of falling behind the state of the art in terms of what it's the experience of building websites and uh you know i i think this is good i mean i know that that you know there are things like you know morton's telemetry and 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 other things that like it would be really good if wordpress was doing and they're not uh and it's partly because there are just limited resources to to go around in terms of where you can focus and yes it might make more sense to try to collect more data sooner but you know if you do that, you'll also have the people on the other side of things saying, why can't we see anything happening? 
Yeah, I think you've made some great points. This is my quick penny's worth, and then we we go for our break, and we come back to our main topic. Um, but the the thing you pointed out, I think this statement from him that for a good cause he would be prepared to see uh, a break in the, the tradition, which is around compatibility of previous versions was extremely revolutionary and um and a key part of the interview um the other bit like what jackie and yourself um have said is that i totally in some ways i totally disagree with matt um i agree with him in one way that you need leadership and like project led by committee isn't the greatest form of getting a really quality product. But I, I feel for the CEO to have to, um, obviously it's not the CEO of WordPress.org, um, it's automatic. And this, this I'm not gonna go in this whole area because uh, I've, I've talked about that, but I think him um, having directly come in and manage um, these crucial areas is a sign of organisational um, impasse. And what, what I think should have happened is that um, lieutenants should have been brought in and they should be full time. And somebody in um, a particular pathway should be full time. Um, and the others can be part time, but at least there's one person in in that um, organ in those organisational sections that is a, the clear leader and isn't juggling, isn't sponsored by other companies. That is gets their salary from the foundation and um, only is, um, it's really clear cut, if you understand. This is how I think things should be organized, but that's only my penny's worth. So, um, and I'm, to I'm normally totally wrong, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so we're gonna go for our breaks, folks, and then when we're gonna come back, we're gonna be talking about um, the resources online written, um, that have guided us in our web design WordPress journey. We'll be back in a minute, folks. We're coming back. I've really enjoyed it so far. Uh, I'm, uh, it's been a bit strange, folks, because my normal office, the internet blew up this morning for the whole building, and I am um, about two minutes' drive is the very nice, very new entrepreneur centre run by the University of Reno and I'm in their foyer area and I know some of the people here and they've given me coffee but you can't see it folks but there's a stream of people working on the it's a small tower block and this is on the other levels there must be the full-time employees for the university and they're all looking at me very strangely what's this strange English person that's talking seems to be broadcasting it's, a, it's like a gold but very strange feeling well sorry folks i'm not really on on um so um we can, we can go to our main subject this is how i see um how um my panel has been very efficient much more than me and they've provided loads of links so what i'm going to ask you panel is talk about one or two of your influences and then i'm going to go on to the next panelists and ask them to talk to one or two of your list of influences um, so that's how we're going to do it and I'm going to start off with Sally so can you talk about a couple of um, online resources or people in, that have really influenced you or part of your list sure so I made a list of things specifically with respect to design and I am not a designer. I have some background in fine art and, and art history, and, and I've learned about principles of design. Um, but I'm not primarily a designer. But, you know, design as a concept is, is pretty wide, if you think about it. It's not, you know, there's a big difference between design and art, design and uh, decoration. 
Uh, and, you know, I've heard a lot of people within the WordPress uh, space, you know, there's a, a great talk Ms. Michelle Sculpt gave about, you know, stop, uh, stop making things pretty and start designing. Uh, and uh, user experience. And I get increasingly sort of pulled into that. But my, my, I would say a lot of my big influences in WordPress have not been sort of as in people that I can think of. It's not so much in the design realm as in broader areas of, of doing things. So if, if I think about like Stephanie Leary and when I read her first WordPress book on development that actually like, you know, hooked into my brain and, and more revolutionary when, when I first heard her speak about content strategy. Or, you know, the first time I saw a WordCamp presentation about responsive design and knew I needed to learn more about that. And then that pulled me into, um, uh, you know, into a lot of the, the reading that I do. Um, you know, things I've heard, lots of things I've heard from Morton, who, you know, we could all just listen to all day and be smarter. Uh, people like Tom McFarlane, like Mika Epstein, uh, you know, who kind of influenced the way I look at the, the, the whole picture of, of development. But design itself is a thing to know about and, and to need to know about how... Uh, you know, what's trendy, what, so I read a lot of things like, you know, I get this daily, sometimes overpowering, you know, web designer news, email, uh, Smashing Magazine, which is sort of some design, some development, but, and, you know, more than WordPress, I started reading it because of the WordPress articles, but there, there's other things, uh, you know, I'm really into CSS Grid right now, I read Rachel Andrew and that, that kind of, of thing, and I think that no matter what your specialty is, you have to pay some attention to design and what's happening with design um, and to apply that sort of design thinking concept of, of everything you're making is for a purpose and, and, you know, I've believed for a long time, you know, form follows function and therefore if you're, if you're going to design it, you need to know what it's doing first. I think that was great. What got a couple of things that influenced you, John? that you'd like to quickly mention to start off with? Yeah, definitely. When I, um, when I first started, I mean, I, I, I um, listened to Paul Boag, Boag World, yeah, uh, Boag. podcast <laughs> way, way back in the day. Um, I'm going to try, I'm going to try and get him on the show, actually, Johnny. He, uh, he slipped out, but he did say he would okay. come on. But um, yeah, definitely. That was a podcast, you know, way before, um, podcasting was like a big thing and um, you know also like Andy Clark yeah yeah stuff like that you know Jeff Jeffrey Zeldman uh, the great Jeremy Keith a lot of those early guys like really shaped how I think about it and because you've got a very similar in some ways you've got a similar journey to me because you were influenced by web design before you became really involved in the WordPress community didn't you mm-hmm Yep. And I'm similar. So um, definitely listen to some of these names that John's mentioned because there's, you know, uh, Alan Clark is a great designer, isn't he? And he's fun to watch as well, isn't he? No, definitely, definitely. And and that's what I'm saying is these are a lot of like people who have been around for like a long time. A lot of the people that we've gotten to interview, which is like phenomenal, but, um, you know, have been influences in, in different ways. And, you know, Morton as well is, is, is a continuation of that lineage of, of uh, you know, thinking about things. And, and like Sally said, design is not just design, like how it looks, it's, it's aspects of it. It's how it works. It's how it feels. It's how people interact with it. You know, it's all these things is, is really what I think of, like when I think of design, not just like, you know, how, the, the pretty happens you know <laughs> and i think even if you're not going to become a full-time designer if you're going to be part of the wordpress if you're going to be involved in wordpress you've got to be aware of the latest trends and what's going on outside the wordpress bubble haven't you john well i think it's really important i think it's really because wordpress is so big and we power 27 percent of the web and all this and we kind of have our own heroes like within wordpress that we look up to 
but I think it is really important to, you know, keep an eye outside of WordPress itself because WordPress is only one part of the, uh, of the web. There's like a whole world of, of people working on stuff with ideas and that are, you know, leading the way. It's, it's, it's really easy to stay inside our, you know, kind of uh, bubble. But yeah, it is really important to, to kind of, you know, look at what other people are doing in all different corners of the web. So are there any kind of resources that you regularly, you know, when you got, when you have got a spare moment, which isn't often, um, but when you do, are there any resources that you look at the present moment that kind of give you an insight of where web design and some of the leaders are doing? Uh, well, definitely. Like I would check out, there's a podcast by Jen Simmons called The Next Web. Uh, she interviews like a lot of people who are on the cutting edge of, uh, you know, what's coming next. That That's a good resource to check out. Um, another thing that you can definitely check out, uh, as uh, Sally mentioned, is the Responsive Design Podcast. It's Ethan Marcotte and, uh, you know, definitely that's that's something to check out. Um, I would say, you know, just for like, just kind of like fancy stuff um, w when it comes to like just tricks and effects and uh, things like that, you can, you know, check out CodePen, what people are doing there. People are really pushing the boundaries of what can be done in a browser. And uh, also I would say, you know, um, can't think of it. Hold on. Uh, not CodePen, but uh, there's a newsletter uh, or there's a site. It's Code Drops. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of, you know, it's cool to like look at just all the, you know, fancy stuff that can happen. But I mean, again, that's just the sizzle. That's not the stake. Yeah. I'll get back to you on um, some other resources, but let's get Jackie yep. in and see. So if you've got, um, you'd like to start off with maybe um, a couple. Let's start off, Jackie, with some things that really influenced you at the start of your journey and there may be a couple of things that um, you regularly go to at the present moment that you feel really help you um, keep up to date with design and where it's going outside the WordPress bubble. Sure. Uh, early on, I really enjoyed magazines, um, beautiful layouts and magazines before the web. Uh, and I think that influenced me in a lot of ways uh, how I, mean, I approach layout today. Um, and that kind of cascades into the whole new journey that's coming with CSS Grid, as Sally just mentioned, and uh, that there's a lot of interest in that. And uh, Chris Coyer's podcast, The Shop Talk Show, they had a great episode with Jen S Simmons and uh, Rachel Andrews on, and I listened to that earlier this week. It was a fantastic episode. You should definitely go listen to it if you build with But Jackie, it. was it as good as our interview, Rachel? Uh, I think this was, I think this was really good. I think they covered some questions that uh, were needed answering, I guess. And it was a, actually, and the other part is, is that- Well, none of the questions of, I, none of the questions I asked, I could you No, can say I just that. think the dynamic of having them both in the conversation at the same time was very good. It, right. uh, there was a lot of interactivity back and forth. So I, I enjoyed it. Um, today, things that influence me are, I, when, I, when I do a lot of browsing and I'm checking websites out, when I'm researching and looking things, I immediately look at, how do I feel when, uh, when I see the website, right? What is my mm -hmm. first impression? And then I try to examine what is it about the elements in that website that, are, that is communicating that feeling to me? Why, why do I feel a certain way when I load a specific website? Um, and that kind of drives my, how I would approach building projects for clients based on what their needs are going to be. So if you're doing a garden center, you know, you have a completely different feeling that you want to convey um, than if you're doing something that requires a lot of activity and a lot of, you know, grit and gut and, you know, like workout stuff. And it's a completely different uh, set of elements that you'd want to show. The other thing that I spend quite a bit of time on now is looking for ways to make designs accessible. 
And I think um, that is a bit more challenging. It's because it's basically getting your mind to think that way through the entire design process instead of trying to fix designs at the end so that they're going to be accessible. So I work with some other designers um, in my daily work. And one of the things that we've all been talking about is being aware of all of these accessibility guidelines while you're putting your designs together, like color contrast and how uh, things work just in the visual design elements. And then of course, on the development side, you know, I'm much more interested in finding pleasing, pleasant ways to make the design accessible. Like just for example, on navigation menus now, I've been using a border bottom to uh, when you hover over it, and uh, using a transparent border bottom when I'm not so that I avoid any shifting of the menu, right? So that's like a, a trick, I guess, I just stumbled on and I was like, okay, I don't want to use underline, text decoration underline. I want to do something better than that. And so I really think it's um, that inspiration of looking for ways to make it accessible and then also make it look really visually pleasing to the visual user is something everybody should be focusing on in their daily design, that they, the work that they're doing. And making clients mindful of that too. So the reason why we did this is, and they actually are very receptive and really like that when you bring it up and say, well, the reason why we added this to your navigation menu is so that for people who are visually impaired, and we're not talking about just blind people, we're talking about people that maybe don't see as well or are colorblind, um, or have some impaired vision and it makes it more difficult to notice changes. Um, so I think that's really important when you're doing your design. I think that that's something that should be an influence now. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. Um, I was just trying to think of some of the things that influenced me. Um, I, I think Clark, um, some of his books, even though they ne I never seem to be able to get to his standard of work were quite influential. Boag World, um, Left Apart. Um, I think they were big in the UK when I was living in the UK and when I was doing some part-time flash and design work, they really influenced me. Um, I think when I got into WordPress, I, I think um, um, CS, CSS tricks um, really influenced me um, and still does. It is a website I go to, which is this mixture, which is this strange mixture of front front end design. Even if you're if you're not actually producing the designs, um, you're still probably more interested in design than somebody that's a hard core back end. PHP or .NET developer, um, so you always got I. It's a strange hybrid. Would you agree with that, John, or do you think I, I've gone off topic there a little bit? No, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, one other thing, another person that, that is probably not very well known uh, inside of WordPress is Frank Camaro. And what you should check out are some of his long form essays. One is called What Screens Want. Um, and I'll link these up in show notes. There's one before that. I'm going to try and find the link for it. But he's given some like very great presentations on uh, what the, the, basically the nature of what the web is and how it can be used as a medium and where it's going. These are definitely things that you should check out. Um, he's uh, a designer uh, out of New York, but uh, definitely, definitely someone to check out. And that's why I say, like, don't limit yourself to just what um, you see other people doing around you, but, you know, kind of, you know, look at like, you know, find what other people are doing and, and figure out, you know, the philosophy behind the web. You know. Oh yeah, try and um, add that to the show notes if you I can. Will. That sounds fine. The um, thing I was going to ask you, Sally, um, mm -hmm. another another thing I've noticed is that there's a lot of interest because obviously um, we take it for granted. Well, um, 
most of us take for granted the iPhone, the explosion um, in UX design, interest in UX design principles um, that seem to come after the iPhone and the tablet. You know, you see a lot of designers um, use the term, they get rid of the, the term designer and they say they're UX, um, UX expert. Um, wording like that. How do you see that affecting design, um, these different devices and the explosion of interest in UX design fundamentals? Well, I think it's high time and it may be that the, uh, <clears throat> that it was, you know, the introduction of, of all these different sizes of mobile screens that forced people to remember that the web is not print. Uh, and this is part of why I was so impressed by uh, resilient web design was that it was a reminder that back in the beginning, the web was fluid. The web was designed to be fluid. Uh, and what happened was that people came in and started um, sort of kludging around to try to make it approximate print. And then we end up with these very rigid layouts and then, oh, wait, we have all kinds of different screen sizes. These layouts don't work. In a way, we sort of have to go back to where we started and how that should, you know, in influence us. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, there are probably people who, you know, who claim to be doing UX who really aren't. And in a way, you know, it's, it's tough to literally design an experience. You know, what we are more often actually building our interfaces in the hopes that people have a particular experience, but we know that we can study the experiences people have when they are using our interfaces and find out. And I've just put a, a link in the chat mm. for a great article I saw, I think it was yesterday, um, uh, from Access Lab about, uh, you know, accessibility according to real people with disabilities that, that somebody had put out on Twitter, just a, a call to like, you know, what do you struggle with most? If you have a disability, what do you struggle with most? And that this huge collection of answers from people who ranged from, you know, deaf to a, uh, and deafness, autism, ADD, uh, uh, you know, in a physical inability to use a mouse, uh, you know, uh, trouble with eyesight and, and what actually made them crazy. It, it interested me that some of these things are, are things that make me crazy, like, like lots of, you know, animation and motion and distraction. Uh, you know, I have some neurological issues and, and I don't handle lots of distraction. So I want, you know, it's like, okay, if something is moving, my eyes will go there. So it better darn well be important. Uh, because otherwise I'm not going to be able to pay attention to anything else that's on the screen at, at the same time. Uh, and so I, th I think, you know, we do need to focus on, on usability, on user experience. And some people have been focused on this forever. I'm going to forget the, the guy's name who's so famous uh, uh, on the subject of, of usability now. Uh, but uh, Jacob Nelson. That one. Yeah, him. Uh, uh, but, you know, this is from the dawn of the web, pretty much, uh, people have been addressing the, these issues, but a lot of people have ignored them. And I think it's just harder to ignore them because we have to take into account all of these different screens, all these different user experiences, uh, all these different circumstances. I mean, you know, once you could sort of predict that somebody would be looking at your stuff while they were, you know, sitting in an office at a desk, and now you don't know. They could be sitting in a subway, you know, they could be in a really noisy environment, a distracting environment. And, and so, uh, you know, we have to think about these things. You know, bu building for the web uh, or for mobile apps is, you know, it's much more complicated than it was 10 years ago. Certainly is. What what did you think of my little? Won't say it was a rant, but my little statement, Jackie. Do you think um, a lot of? I saw a lot of people's um, resumes, you know, from the designer background. You know, that before the phone, they never really the iPhone and the explosion. UX wasn't mentioned that much and then suddenly UX design became very important in the design community. What was your thoughts around that, Jackie? Well, oh. I think that 
Come on, Jackie, just give it to me, Jackie. Right. I'm talking a load of I rubbish. Think that, I think that, you know, first of all, a smartphone, it's really not a website that you're looking at. It's just some streams of data. Yeah. And I think that that is, a, there's a different way of looking at it from, and I, and I wrote an article, a little uh, post not too long ago about, you know, letting go of the desktop mindset. And that kind of sums up where things are because you, it's a completely different experience on a phone and you have to be asking yourself, what does the user need um, from, the, from the mobile device when they're viewing a website? And that is completely different than what they might yeah, can I on a desktop. Just, can I just slightly interrupt and just put this to you? Uh, um, it just occurred to me when you just said that is um, they seem to be to me a lot confused, not confusion, but the wrong direction. See, apps to me, an app is focused on one action, one over overwhelming experience, where a website. Um, you know, it might be dealing with one company, but that co most companies have multiple functions, multiple offers, whatever you want to call them. So trying to make a website like an app or trying to make an app like a website, to me is a fundamental misunderstanding of both areas. What What's your thoughts about that? I agree. And I think that, you know, most of the large companies that I would have an app for, like my bank and things like that on my phone, that's a completely separate app. That has nothing to do with their website. I mean, it's, and it works very well on the phone because it was designed to work on the phone uh, or on a, on a tablet or something. And I think that um, the idea that you can build a website and make it work um, beautifully on every device in every situation and serve up the exact same data is um, impossible. I think that's well, really well, Paul. What, what's your thoughts about that, John? If you mute, John. Oh, sorry, say it one more time. I'm sorry. Um, I thought there was, um, you see, a misunderstanding. I think an app, to me, an app should do one thing really well. Um, or um, it should have one global task and might have some subtasks where a website um, obviously it might be about one company but that company will have multiple offerings normally and um, to me this attempt to turn a website into an app or uh, turn an app into a website in some ways is why a lot you see a lot of rubbish out there what do you think john okay so what you're talking about is is an argument that has really been going around for the you know the last seven or eight years which is native versus web which is better um let's face it like phones are ubiquitous they're everywhere everyone in the world relies on their smartphone at this point uh except for one person, present company. But, um, um, but apps are, uh, you know, a necessary thing, you know, but they are not the web. They are native development. I mean, they're their own special type of web development. Yeah. Um, the web, I, I think there's been a lot of disdain for the, the open web and web development, but the, for an app, like you have to access it on a device. The web is open to everyone. They are similar in the fact that they're both web development um, or they're both development, I should say. But an and app is a closed system and the web is, is you know, it's, it's an open system. Anybody with a browser can access it. Um, you know, there, there are two different things. There are two different animals. Uh, they're both, uh, you know, basically necessary components of, of today's uh, development, you know, system. But yeah, I, I, they're just two different things, you know, they're just yeah. two different things. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Um, we're going to wrap it up now in the show notes. We're going to have a list of all the resources that our um, panel have provided and, 
and um, they'll be there for you folks so don't worry go to the website and they'll be there I think it's been a really interesting discussion a very broad discussion but I think um, design influences are really important if you're starting off in web development and you're more of the coder but front end you've got you've got to be aware of these influences and um yeah i think we've done a good job um we're going to let the panel um say how they can be contacted and found i'll start off with jackie where can you be found jackie you can find me on twitter at jdelia or on my website at jackiedelia.com or you can head over to rethink.fm and yeah. find me there Oh, that's great. Thanks, Jackie. What about you, Sally? Where can people find more words of wisdom from you? You can find me at uh, WPFangirl.com is my company. Uh, EastBayWP.com is the meetup. I'm at Sally Getch on Twitter, and I do actually have opinions about apps for his websites. Oh, I'm sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, John? How can people find you? Right. You can find me at LockdownDesign.com, or you can follow me on Twitter, lockdown underscore what about you jonathan oh yeah thanks for that john but before that i'll just say folks last weekend i went to the orange county wood camp and um it was fantastic fun it was fantastically run um by the um, team somebody wants somebody by the team and um one of the highlights was friday um sunday morning where chris lemmer had a with a, um, presenting a group of people that were going to be judged by their plugins that they had developed specifically for a competition um, and that was hilarious actually Chris Lemmer was at his best and it was a bit of a laugh um, I just thought I'd just plug that because I really enjoyed it and um, it really highlighted some of the strengths of the WordPress community really um, how to get hold of me um, it's quite easy folks you can get hold of me on Twitter at Jonathan Denwood I'm trying to do more Facebook I say that every, every, every episode but I am attempting it and um, please give us a um, review on iTunes I say it every week um, but it really does help us um, with iTunes that also announced some changes this morning that um, sounded really interesting and will help podcasters in general so I'm going to wrap it up now folks it's been a great show um, see you next week and every like every episode get your dose of WordPress medicine on WB.it see you later folks bye <laughs>